pray and then we'll come around God's word. Father, we thank you for your goodness and this morning as we come around your word, Holy Spirit, we invite you to open our hearts and our spiritual ears. We, we know your word doesn't return to you void. Let it soak into our hearts and produce a harvest, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This morning, uh, I want to talk about going deeper in God. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment. But if you'd like to meet me in 1 Samuel chapter 30, I want to talk to you this morning about a, a, an incident in David's life. I remember watching a documentary on Steve Monaghetti. Um, the reason I watched the documentary was I'm fascinated why anybody would run unless the police are chasing them. I don't see any other point. I don't see any other point. I'm not saying I've practiced that, Terry. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, more about that later. Um, but uh, Steve Monaghetti, uh, I mean, this guy was running 42 kilometres uh, for a marathon. We had a, we had a gentleman at Lagana, uh, Norm McDonald, 82 years of age, and uh, still running marathons and still running the city to surf every year with his son. And he was almost heartbroken the last time I spoke to him because he noticed his times had begun to slip. Shame on him. But... One thing I noticed with Steve Monaghetti, he says that uh, every marathon runner, he said it's different for every marathon runner. And uh, he says, but he says all of us face the same thing. He says over the 40 kilometres, somewhere along the line, he said, every one of us hit a wall. He said there's a wall that you hit and it's where your body is screaming at you to stop. Your body's screaming at you to stop. I've had that happen a few times. It's like when I get out of bed most of the times now, but... But he says, and everything inside of you is telling you just to stop and give up. He says, but if you can persevere and push your body beyond the wall, he says, you hit this kind of plateau and you you feel like you can go on forever. And I've never hit that wall running. And I, I kind of don't have any, God hasn't told me that I need to try that out. But I also, Mick Fanning was the surfer I was trying to think of, Baz, that we were talking about the other day, Mick Fanning. I appreciate Mick Fanning. But what I appreciated was in a documentary, he was on 60 Minutes, and they, they asked him about his passion for surfing. And he said, you know what, I can't describe it. He said, but he said, when you're surfing, he said, you wait for the right wave, you get on the top, you stand on your board. He said, and you're on the top of the wave. He said, and everything stands still. He said, like, for almost an eternity. He said, and you know you've got two choices. You either back off the wave and wait for another one. He says, or you tip over the front of the wave. And he says, you know that if you tip over the front of the wave, you're all in. There's no going back. And many of us here are kind of like Steve Monaghetti, I feel. We hit that wall. I want to, I want to take you through a process today where David hit a wall Many of us say we want to go deeper with you, Lord, and we want to be all in, but what does that look like? And I believe that many of us get to the crest of that wave when we look and we back back down the wave, but maybe some of us get to the wall like Steve Monaghetti does and we go, you know what, I'm just going to give up. I want to encourage you today because all of us will face those walls and they are moments in our lives when God wants to move us deeper with him. A little bit of context, as we come to 1 Samuel chapter 30, what we often forget about David is, David was anointed to be king over Israel at the age of 15. For those who don't know the story, Samuel the prophet, one of the greater prophets in the Old Testament, but Samuel the prophet is told by God after King Saul is rejected to go to the house of Jesse and find a king, anoint me a king. So he goes there and all these strapping young lads come out. Look a little bit like Rob, strapping young lads, yeah, I thought I'd throw you a bone, bro. It's all right. <laughs> and if you're going to sit on the front. Uh, and he goes through the whole list and God says, no, 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 no. And uh, this is a great uh, digression for a moment. But if you ever want to know who it is that God's going to use, look for the least expected, by the way. And so what God says is, no, 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 no. And then Jesse, and Samuel says, surely you've got another son. And Jesse says, well, yeah, I've got some ruddy little runt out tending the sheep. And Samuel says, go get him. Daniel comes in at 15 and he's anointed king over Israel. What we forget is, it is 15 years between there and when David sits on the throne over Israel. And in those 15 years, David knows much heartache. He's pursued by King Saul. And leading up to chapter 30, what we find is, 
that he has been pursued relentlessly over a long period of time. He's hidden in caves. He's sick of running. He's always, his life is forever under threat. And then he gets to chapter 27 and he does something that we all tend to do. He says in his own heart, I will go to the Philistines. What does he want to go to the Philistines for? I will go to the Philistines. I will, I will make an alliance with them. I, I will sort this out. I will seek security with them. And then he gets to the Philistines and they reject him and say, no. So he packs up his 600 men and he heads home and that's where we're going to pick it up now. But what I want everybody to realise is just on the other side of what we're going to go through now, the moment, David's about to hit a really serious wall in his life and he's about to make his way through that wall. And on the other side, the very next chapter, King Saul dies. And then the very first chapters in 2 Samuel, he becomes king over Judah and by chapter 5 in 2 Samuel, he's king over all Israel. You see, God is wanting to take David into the fullness of his calling and his anointing. But what's the problem? We've got some issues we've got to sort out first. Let's begin to read what uh, chapter 30 has for us. Now, when David and his men came to Ziklag, this is very important. On the third day, the Amalekites, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag. Now, Ziklag, interestingly, in the Hebrew means a measure that is pressed or something or someone that is pressed. Uh, Some people here uh, may or may not know, but my former life, I was very heavily involved in drug manufacturing. Everybody just turned left and went, yes, I told you. (laughs) That that, that explains a lot. Uh, Let me give you a little bit of context. Uh, For six months of my life, I worked in a morphine factory. (laughs) Uh, so it's not, it's not like the Breaking Bad series or anything like that. But uh, it was the worst job I ever had, by the way. I couldn't wait to get out of the place. It was the most disorganised, uh, chaotic place I've ever worked. However, I did learn some stuff. I learned, I learned that the guys who owned the place had no idea what they were doing. The second thing I learned was uh, there were three major stages in the process. And the first one was um, where we call the, the seed room. What happens is they take the alkaloid or the poppies and they put them into a big hopper and it feeds its way down into a seed room. The idea is that it comes into a big basket, you pick out all the rubbish, it extracts the seeds into these huge bags and then it goes down to another place which is called extraction. We're going to come back to extraction in a moment. But... And then the last one is refinement. I worked in refinement because I'm very refined. They said you must have to... Yeah, that's, that's not what they said. <coughs> that's not what they said when I left either. But uh, aside from all of that, uh, I found that extraction was the most important place. And uh, we had a bit of a different process to some of the other companies, but what would happen is the, the poppies would come out of the seed room and when they got to extraction, they would hit a series of hammers. Anyone that's got any idea of uh, kind of process work, Baz, you might understand a little bit. And the idea of the hammers was to break everything up and then they would go into these big tanks where they would be kind of filtered with lime. And the whole idea is that we're going to take everything that's bad out And then that liquid was put into this enormous hydraulic press. David's about to go just like that. David's going to feel like he's in an enormous hydraulic press. And what would happen is when everything went into this press, all the rubbish would stay in the bags and all the good stuff would come out and then they would go down to refinement. And God wants to take so many of us and we reach this place many times in our lives we actually hit these walls in our spiritual journey many times because god wants to take us deeper but we get to extraction and go this is painful god wants to empty us and god wants to leave some stuff behind there's people here this morning that have got to leave some stuff behind have a listen to david's story see if you can begin to resonate with what's going on here. Verse 2, they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. I'm going to digress for a moment. Uh, The Amalekites, by the way, for those that know the story, uh, King Saul was told to go and completely wipe out the Amalekites. And what happens is he goes there, he gets victory over the Amalekites, has a great victory, but he doesn't wipe them out like God told him to. And what we actually find with Israel is the Amalekites become this annoying pest. And sometimes there are things in our lives that we just kind of tolerate. Those little things, and they will, I tell you, they will undo you because that's what's happened to David here now. Absolutely undone him. Completely and utterly emptied David. Have a listen to this. And they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small 
and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive. Ahinoam and Jezreel, I know what's wrong with Sharon and Karen, that'll do. And Abigail, the widow of Nabal of Carmel. And David, this is the important part, verse 6. I wonder if we can begin to identify with David right now. And David was greatly distressed. You ever had those moments in your life where it feels like everything's going wrong all at the same time? You ever, had those, you ever had those moments in your life when you feel like everybody at work wants to kill you? And you get home and the dogs run away and the cats run away. Please chase the dog and leave the cat. Have you ever had days like that? The kids are screaming. You get home and you, you walk in and say to your wife, I've got four kids, I can only count two. Where's the other two? You know, it's like, and everything seems to be going wrong. And everywhere you turn, something else goes wrong. Happens differently for all of us. It's, it's like we hit a wall. It's like everything's going along okay. It's like we're managing okay, God. Everything's going along all right. And then all of a sudden, uh, it's like there's a really uh, profound Greek word to describe what happens. It's the crapaola hits the fan. <laughs> You've got to be really theological to be able to unpack that word. But how many of us can identify with those moments in our lives? And how many of us get to those moments and everything falls apart and we drop our bundle? And we go, I can't carry on any further. I can't go any further. Uh, turns out you could be right where God wants you. And it turns out that just on the other side of that, depending on how we deal with the walls in our lives, will depend on whether we step deeper and deeper with God. Let me unpack this word distress a little bit better for you. Uh, the word distressed here means to be in torment or deeply anguished. Uh, you ever had those times in your life when you feel like you're in torment, everything's going wrong, you feel like everybody's against you? If we read on here, uh, David is greatly distressed because not only is his hometown on fire, not only have they pillaged everything, they even took the cats, but not only have they done all of that, his men want to stone him. Everything's against him. Well, there was another man in Scripture that reached a similar point, and his name was Jacob. And for those that know the story of Jacob, the, the other place that this word distressed is used in exactly the same context is in Genesis chapter 32. But what's happened there is uh, God appears, he does that a lot in Genesis, by the way, God appears to, God appeared to Jacob, what a, what a beautiful word. And when he does, he says to Jacob, you know, I'm going to bring you back to your land. I'm going to restore you, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can read the promises. And Jacob says, if, if you're going to do all of that, if you're going to take care of me like that, then you're going to be my God. I don't want anything or anybody else. And God immediately begins to fulfill his promise. But the problem is that between where Jacob is and between where God wants to take him is Esau. Last time Jacob saw Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. Jacob knows Esau's coming. Jacob knows that he has grown in strength. In fact, a nation will come from Esau called Edom. Jacob sends servants ahead and says, go and find out what's going on. I'm paraphrasing now. I'm in the Sean English version this morning. But he says, go ahead and find out what's going on. These dudes come running back and go, yeah, Esau's coming and he's got a plethora with him. Jacob is enormously distressed. That's what we are told in verse 7 of chapter 32. Jacob was greatly distressed. Wow. What does Jacob do? Jacob puts all of his people and all of his belongings on one side of the river. And he gets alone with God. And many people say that Jacob wrestled with God, but that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that a man came and wrestled with Jacob. And that was one of the most profound moments in Jacob's life. He knew hardship all of his life, but at that moment of great distress, at that moment where he hit the wall, what happened? He gets alone with God, he wrestles with God, and his name is changed and his whole trajectory is changed. 
You're not Jacob anymore. You're not the deceiver anymore. You're not the one that robbed Esau anymore. You're Israel. You're the one I'm going to form a nation through. Completely changed. Of course, for the rest of the story, he meets Esau. Esau's like, it's no problem, bro. We're all good. And they both go their separate ways. But Jacob was greatly distressed. David was greatly distressed. He was in desperate anguish. Anybody ever felt like David? Anybody ever had moments where you're thinking to yourself, I've got nowhere else to turn? Turns out you're probably right where God wants you. They're what I like to call divine dilemmas, where God places you deliberately in circumstances and situations where you've got nowhere else to turn but him where you've got nobody else to rely on except for him. And the reason God's doing that is he wants to empty you so that he can fill you again. And just like that process of extraction, there's some stuff you've got to leave behind if you're going to go deeper with God. Let's have a look at what David did. What do we do when we find ourselves in those situations? If you're sitting here this morning going, my life's hunky-dory, Pastor. Everything's rocking. Put your seatbelt on. Because I guarantee you, if you want to go deeper in your relationship with God, you have to go through these walls. For those that were here for our intimacy in marriage, there are walls in marriage you have to work your way through to get to deeper levels of intimacy. Everybody's going, I forgot that. (laughs) But what does David do? Verse 6, And David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because all the people were bitter in soul. Listen to the language. Each for his sons and daughters. Here's what David does. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. I love that verse. I love that line. David is faced with a choice. Uh, uh, Israel, if we backtrack, Israel's coming out of Egypt. And what happens is, uh, as they're coming out of Egypt, everything's hunky-dory, and they make their way to the Red Sea, and they're all going, "Uh uh-oh. And then they turn around, and before we get to this place, God directly takes them on this path. But then they they turn around and Egypt's pursuing them from behind and they immediately realise we've got uh, the Red Sea in front of us and we've got Egypt behind us. We can't overcome the Red Sea and we can't... They look every direction horizontal and it's not until they look vertical that everything changes. God says to Moses, take your staff and the waters just part. David has done a similar thing here. David can't turn to the left or to the right. All of his men are against him. Everybody is against him. He's got nobody left in his hometown, nobody that he can run to. Where do you turn when you find yourself in those positions? Do what David does, but he strengthened himself in the Lord. For those that are uh, mechanically minded, I remember um, I used to work on cars and stuff and these guys would come in with these hotted up cars and one of the accessories you had to have was a drop tank in your fuel tank. I don't know if anybody here can resonate with that, but these guys would hot up, you'd have your normal capacity fuel tank and then you'd have a drop tank. And the drop tank was there in case you run out of fuel. What's wrong with the fuel gauge, right? But these guys knew that if we kind of run out of fuel, it's all right, we'll just flick a switch and then we can draw on the drop tanks. That's kind of where David's at right now. He's come completely and utterly empty of himself and he says, I need to flick a switch. I need to, I need to stop looking at everything that's going on around me. I need to stop looking for all the answers inside of me. Don't we always do that? You know, if everything's going pear-shaped in our finances, the first thing we do is we've got to do a tighter budget. If everything's going wrong in our marriage, we we run everywhere and anywhere before we run to God. I'm not saying you shouldn't do budgets. I'm not saying you shouldn't seek help in marriages or whatever it is. We run to doctors and everything first. Run to doctors, do all of that, but turn your eyes to Jesus first. It's as simple as that. It's as simple as changing our focus. Now, back in Judges chapter 20, an interesting thing takes place. The other place we find this word strengthened, it can also mean encourage, to encourage or build ourselves up in the Lord. We'll get to how we can do that in a moment. But back in Judges chapter 20, we see that Israel uh, and the little tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin's being a bit of a nuisance. They've got these people that are uh, kind of 
sinning and the wicked. And, and Israel say, look, you've got, to get these, you've got to purge the evil from among us. And, and Benjamin says, no, 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 we're right, thanks. We'll, we'll row our own boat. So Israel decides they're going to fight against Benjamin. And Benjamin's the, it's the whole chapter with the left-handed guys and the archers and stuff. But what happens is, it's interesting because what Israel do is it says they inquired of the Lord, shall we fight against Benjamin? And God says, yes, send Judah up. Oh, okay, no problems. So they get Judah. Judah runs on up and they get horribly defeated and 22,000 people die that day. How many people have thought, God's told me to do this. I'm sure God told me to. Did I miss something here? How many people have had God say go and then the minute you step out, everything falls apart? And you're thinking to yourself, what on earth has happened here? Did I get this wrong? Last time I go and talk to the pastor about that. (laughs) It's not what Israel did. It says exactly the same word in the Hebrew. It says that they took courage and they redrew the battle lines and then they inquired of the Lord again and they cried out to God. And there are people in this room that need to do exactly that. You need to take courage and redraw the battle lines in your life and say, I'm going forward. The enemy snuck across the boundaries. It's time to redraw the battle lines. Israel took courage. But how is it that we can strengthen ourselves and encourage us? Reflecting on this, if we, if we reflect on the writings of David, David writes things like, why art thou downcast, O my soul? Rejoice in God. He speaks to himself. It's only crazy when you start answering yourself. Here's three things I think we can do to strengthen ourselves or encourage ourselves. I think the first one is remember God's love. You read through the Psalms, you'll find that David would come often back and remember God's love. And we often forget, no matter what's going on in our lives, we forget that we live under friendly skies and God actually loves us. And sometimes, even though what we're going through is horrible and terrible and we don't want to be where we are, sometimes God's love looks like you have to go through this. Number one, remember God's love. Number two is remember God's promises and his calling. What's What's the number one thing that David can remember right now? Everything looks like it's falling apart. He, he's supposed to have been the king over Israel. What's the number one thing he can do right now? Ah, oh, that's right, God. Yes. Whatever's going on right now, I know you will take me to the throne because you anointed me. I know you will keep your promises. Number one, remember God's love. Number two, remember God's promises and his calling. Number three, this is the really important part. This is the one that helps me, I think, and it's something we should do over communion. Remember God's faithfulness. Remember all the times in your life that God's come through in the past. Remember all those times when your back's been to the wall and God has come through. Remember all those times you're in financial hardship. You don't know how and you don't know why, but you came out the other side and everything's okay. Remember that time when you thought your marriage was going to fall apart, but somehow you are all still together and moving forward. Remember how you thought they were going to sack you at work and you'd be without work, but they did sack you, but you found something. Has you ever look back at how God has steered you through and kept you and preserved you? What does David do? I remember that God loves me. I remember that I'm called to be the king of Israel, and I know that God has protected me for the last almost 15 years, I know God will protect me now. But David strengthened himself. He encouraged himself. He built himself up in the Lord his God. And then David did something. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of... Hamilic, or whatever that is, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod, ephod to David. Now the ephod was a breastplate. It, it, was, it contained a rare and precious jewel that represented 12 tribes of Israel, but it also had on it the umen and the thurman, which was a way of seeking guidance from God. Now how that exactly happened, how they determined a yes or no from that, depends on what rabbi you're listening to, what answer you get. That's not really what's important right now. What's important is where David shifts his focus to. 
David shifts his focus. Now, the common sense thing is that David would say, let's just go and get our wives. What have we got to lose? The place is burnt anyway. Well, let's just go and get everything back. And, but David does not make another move, another decision, until he does something. And it says that, verse 8, and David inquired of the Lord. David inquired. David asked. David sought an answer from God. And what we see happens there, uh, the, I think it was J.C. Ryle that said, the greatest act of disbelief is prayerlessness, but the greatest act of faith is prayer, is where we come, because what prayer does is it shifts our focus from our strength, it shifts our focus from our resources to looking to another one's resources, looking to God's resources. What happens here is an enormous trust in reliance and dependence. David broke through that wall. Every single one of us here will have zigzags in our lives. Every single one of us will have moments in our lives that we will reach exactly like David is and we are left with a choice. Just like Mick Fanning described at the top of that wave, we're all left with a choice. Do I I go over the front of the wave and leave everything behind? God is calling people in this room deeper. Remember, uh, speaking of inquiring of the Lord, remember in Joshua where often when we speak about the promised land, so many people have a picture of pina coladas or martinis. You know, I'm going to enter the promised land, I'm going to sit back in my speedos on the beach drinking martinis. That wouldn't be the promised land, I know that. Not with speedos on. (laughs) But if you read the account in scripture, what we find is that the moment Israel entered the promised land, that's when their battles began. In fact, they had many enemies to overcome once they, to possess the land, and they had many battles in keeping their borders. Have a look at Israel geographically. If God is not sustaining that country, I don't know who is. All the nations around them, are, they're only sustained by God. But there was an incident, I think it's in chapter 7 of Joshua. There's an incident where uh, they come across a little town called Ai. It's not artificial intelligence, it's just called Ai. Nobody actually really knows where it is, but what God, uh, they, they know they've got to overtake Ai, but they don't say anything. This time they do something enormously different. They send spies up to Ai and they come back and say, you know what, Josh... I'm not talking in 2021 language here. Josh, dude, it's all good. There's like only a couple of uh, bros up there. We can sort this out. Just, we'll just take a couple hundred men with us. We'll sort this out. No dramas at all. Okay, no worries. And so off they go and they are horribly defeated and they run back with their tail between their legs and it actually says that the hearts of Israel melted. We've overcome Jericho. The walls of Jericho fell down and we can't overcome this little one. What was different? It was the only time they didn't inquire of the Lord. Only time they had a battle where Joshua didn't inquire of the Lord first. What did Joshua say? We got this. I'm going to ask the worship team if they can prepare to come back. I want to talk to you today as I conclude about another man that hit a wall. Another man in scripture that hit a wall and his name is Jesus. And Jesus would find himself in a place called Gethsemane. And in the Greek, Gethsemane means the olive press. And we read that he suffered such torment. He was so troubled that he sweat drops of blood. He begged his disciples to watch and pray with him, but they kept falling asleep. But it's in the Garden of Gethsemane that we hear these words. Father, if it is your will, take this cup from me, but not as I will. Your will be done. Now, when Jesus said the last part of that sentence, he knew full well that meant that he was going to get up, be betrayed by all of those that were close to him. Only one disciple will be at the foot of the cross. 
Every single one of them that said, we will die with you if we have to, will take off and head for the hills. He would find himself exchanged for a horrible, rebellious murderer by the name of Barabbas. The same crowd that laid palms in front of him as he came riding in on the donkey would now yell, crucify him. He knows what it means when he says, not my will be done, but your will be done. And I love the Garden of Gethsemane, I'll tell you why. It's like for me personally, the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus rises up, walks out, and I know from that moment, every step he takes, he's chosen to take. Every step he takes is, I am willingly going to the cross. I choose to go to the cross. And from that moment, of course, it means salvation for us. Many of us face those same areas in our lives. And God is trying to bring us to exactly the same point where we say, not my will be done, but your will be done. I wonder if there's people sitting here this morning. I wonder if you can resonate with David. I wonder if I wonder if you found yourself at a wall. I know I found myself at heaps. But I found with God that God keeps bringing us to places where we've got to leave stuff behind before we can move any deeper with him. But I want to encourage you. When it feels like the crapola has hit the fan, God is trying to take you deeper. God is wanting to draw you closer but there's often some stuff we have to leave behind. If you need prayer this morning, then myself and the prayer team are available, but I'm going to close in prayer and then let us sing as we conclude today. Father, I thank you that Ziklag is not the end of David's story and it was never intended to be the end of any of our story either. In fact, for David, Ziklag was an enormous beginning, not an ending. And Lord, for those walls that you bring us to, for the garden of Gethsemane that we find ourselves in, Lord, may we recognise that we are not at the end, but we are at the beginning. I pray that every person would be drawn closer to you. I pray that you would take us through the process of extraction, Lord, I pray. That we may be closer to you. In your wonderful